in 1976, a Western film directed by Don Siegel and starring John Wayne was released in theaters. That film was The Shootist, and it was John Wayne's final role on the big screen. It has an amazing supporting cast. People like Lauren Bacall, Ron Howard, Jimmy Stewart, Richard Boone, Hugh O'Brien, Harry Morgan, John Carradine, and Scatman Carruthers. It tells the story of J.B. Books, a gunfighter who arrives in Carson City, Nevada, and immediately gets told that he's dying of cancer. He ends up finding lodging at a boarding house owned by Bond Rogers, played by Lauren Bacall. She's a widow who lives with her son, Gillum, played by Ron Howard. His initial attempts are to remain anonymous, but before long, the whole town knows he's living there, and he's quite the star in the town's eyes. It seems like everybody wants to profit off of his name, or they want to kill him. When John Wayne's character arrives at the doctor's office, played by Jimmy Stewart, Stewart ends up mentioning that it's been 15 years since they last saw each other. The inside joke on that statement is that Wayne and Stewart last worked together on The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance in 1962, which was 15 years before this film was done. The Undertaker, played by John Carradine, also appeared with Wayne and Stewart in that film. Now, John Wayne just doesn't look good in this film. And you can tell he's not very healthy during its filming. As a matter of fact, he fell ill with influenza during the production and was hospitalized for two weeks. During this time, production was completely shut down. It was really uncertain at that point whether the film would actually be completed or not because Wayne was so ill that his doctors were really close to stopping him from continuing on filming it. Like I said, this is pretty obvious. You take a look at John Wayne and compare him to his earlier roles, and there's just something different about him. Granted, he's older, but he's just not a well individual during this time. Now, contrary to popular belief, he didn't have cancer at the time that this film was made. His entire left lung and several ribs had been removed in surgery on September 17th. 1964. But by 1969, he was declared cancer-free. It was not until January 12, 1979, almost three years after this movie had been filmed, that the disease was found to have returned. He actually did some television public service announcements for the American Cancer Society that began with a clip of a scene from this film. And that's the one where the doctor tells him that he has cancer. Ron Howard plays a great role in the film. And you see him in a different light than you're used to seeing him or that you remember him. As you know, he went on to become one of the best directors in the business. And he was probably the best child actor that I've ever seen. His time on The Andy Griffith Show kind of cemented him into the fact that he is a qualified actor, especially at this young age. He was able to show emotions that most child stars didn't do. Ron was asked one time during the filming, if John Wayne had given him any acting tips. And he said that during the filming of the final shootout scene, Wayne took him aside and he gave him a little bit of advice. Ron was sitting there eagerly awaiting the profound advice that was going to spew from John Wayne's mouth. And all he told him was, Ron, if you want to look menacing, close your mouth. The horse owned and given away by John Wayne's character was his real own horse. The horse's name was Dollar, and he had ridden with John Wayne in a variety of movies, including Big Jake, The Cowboys, True Grit, Rooster Cogburn, and Chisholm. To add a sense of realism to Wayne's character, archival footage from several of his westerns was used to introduce us to his character of J.B. Books. And this happens after the beginning credits. Included in that footage was his movie Red River from 1948, Hondo from 1953, Rio Bravo from 1959, and El Dorado 
from 1966. John Wayne just didn't like the disappointing box office that the film produced. But he blamed most of this on Paramount for not marketing the film very well. He complained that they spent too much time on the then-current King Kong epic and relied too heavily on John Wayne's brand name alone to sell the film, which by 1976 was not a sure thing like it was in years past. Originally, John Wayne didn't want to grow the beard in order to play J.B. Books. However, after a period of time, he let it sink in and he agreed that that was the right look for that character. He was great to the people of Carson City. All the locals loved him while he was staying at one of the local hotels during the filming. They said he would sign autographs for young people nonstop. John Wayne never forgot his fans. Now, John Wayne had to slip a little Easter egg in about his old friend and constant movie companion, Ward Bond. These two guys were tight as they could be. And when Ward Bond died, John Wayne lost his closest friend in the business. But as a way to honor him, Lauren Bacall's character had the first name of Bond, which is a strange first name for a lady. He just had to find some way to honor his old friend. Now, despite John Wayne's considerable influence on any movie set, the director, Don Siegel, said that he and Wayne got along really well. They shared ideas. Some of them they liked, some of them they didn't like. But they didn't fight over any of the scenes that they discussed. They developed a real like for each other and respected each other's work. Now, where did the title come from? It's said to have come from the gunslinger Clay Allison. Allison was a bounty hunter and a hired killer whose marksmanship and his homicidal rages made him feared across Texas. When anyone asked what he did, he would tell them that he was employed as a shootist. There's one scene where you see him reach up with a long stick to turn on the ceiling fans in the bar. The ceiling fans in this saloon were common at the turn of the century. Unlike the ceiling fans of today, they didn't have motors, but they were connected to a belt system. A motor is mounted on the ceiling in the back of the building or the room, and a long belt is suspended from the ceiling that connects to each fan. At the bottom of each fan, there is a cam that is turned in order to engage the clutch so that the fan comes on. Wayne was highly self-conscious of his public image. He considered it unmanly to be photographed in production stills while makeup was being applied with a powder puff. He also insisted on using a particular reddish tint of makeup, which was kind of flattering to his complexion, but it created headaches for the cinematographers. He also insisted on toning down the profanity and the more explicit references to cancer from the original novel that the script was taken from. Now let's talk about Jimmy Stewart and his great role as the doctor. He only agreed to play this cameo role in the film because John Wayne had specifically requested him. His short time on the film proved to be a trying one, though. The bad acoustics in the huge sound stages worsened his hearing difficulties. He stayed by himself most of the time. He just felt terribly uncomfortable because he couldn't hear things. He and John Wayne muffed their lines so often in the main scene that the director accused them of not trying hard enough. Wayne kind of ended up explaining it later on after the film was done, and he said that Stewart knew his lines, but he hadn't been able to hear his cues, and that in turn caused his own fumbling. So these two were not a good combination in this film, even though they both were great actors for years and years. Age had kind of took its toll, especially on Jimmy Stewart. His career had basically ended years before. 
and he was only paid $50,000 for his part. The original screenplay had Gillum Rogers, played by Ron Howard, shooting and killing J.B. Books. In the screenplay, the killing disturbed Gillum so much that he throws away the pistol and leaves the bar repulsed by the act. John Wayne had the script changed so that Books is killed by the bartender, who is then killed by Rogers. What a great movie this is, and it's always a thrill to see John Wayne on the screen. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll continue to chase the classics.